Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I guess they saved the best for last. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have to worry about do we have any questions from the audience at the end of this presentation, judging by the number of questions that we've already received. But uh, yes, once again, good morning. I am Scott Warnock. I'm mayor of the uh, township of Tay on the shores of uh, southern Georgian Bay in the province of Ontario and a proud member of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence City Initiative. I am especially pleased to moderate this panel on invasive pragmites, an invasive plant that is quickly becoming one of the most pressing issues for many communities in the Great Lakes region. The plant, of course, spreads quickly, takes over wetland ecosystems, and can damage important municipal infrastructure. Uh, just a couple of quick comments about uh, the township of Tay. Uh, First of all, some of you may have been at Queen's Park back in October. We had a wonderful day at Queen's Park. And uh, since then, uh, the Township of Tay has worked very closely with the Severn Sound Environmental Association. Keith Sherman is here as a representative from that association. Uh, we held a public information session in the town of Midland that was attended by municipal staff, elected officials, and a number of residents. Also, one of our speakers on the panel today was part of that discussion, so you're going to be well informed, I can assure you. We also hosted a public information session uh, in collaboration with Georgian Bay Forever for many of our seasonal residents who are experiencing the problem of Phragmites firsthand. To give you an idea, uh, we have a number of waterfront parks in the township of Tay. One of them is just around the corner from where uh, my wife and I live, and I'm about six feet tall. I went down there not too long ago, and if you take my height and double it, that's how high the Phragmites are. They are well over 10 feet and, and growing each and every day. With that being said, uh, Tay Township Council applied and received $6,000 from the Land Stewardship and Habitat Restoration Program to do work on eradicating Phragmites in six of our waterfront parks in both Victoria Harbor and Port Nicol, including the one that I just talked about, which is Mackenzie Beach Park. We had to have some skin in the game, so we matched dollar for dollar. And staff will be meeting with representatives from Georgian Bay forever in the next month or so to look at training models and how we can work at properly eradicating Phragmites. I would like to welcome the panel to now join me up here and we will begin our presentation on Phragmites. We have an excellent panel assembled to present scientific, policy and community level perspectives on Phragmites management in both the US and Canada. I would like to call on our panel members Dr. Janice Gilbert, Heather Braun, and Nancy Vidler to please join me on the stage. Welcome, ladies. Our first presenter will be Dr. Nance, uh, Dr. Janice Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert is a wetland ecologist from Langton, Ontario, who works as a scientific advisor on Phragmites to the Nature Conservancy Canada and the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. She is also a founder and co-chair of the Ontario Invasive Phragmites Working Group and lead author on over 60 invasive Phragmites-related reports and presentations. Janice has provided Phragmites advice to municipalities, First Nations, private companies, and charitable organizations. She holds a PhD from Ohio State University. Go Buckeyes. <laughs> that didn't go over very well with Detroit Public TV, but. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Janice. Thank you very much for the introduction. I, I just want to make one clarification. I, I didn't uh, found the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. It was the Ontario Phragmites Working Group. I just want to make that clear. So uh, anyway, thank you. It's a delight to be here to speak to you about Phragmites today. Um, 
Nancy and I arrived yesterday afternoon, and we're just at the tail end of, of the session. And oh, we wish we had been able to come here sooner because there's just some great uh, discussions going on and, and information exchange. And it's really, uh, for me, um, just uh, um, inspiring to see our politicians so engaged in, in these issues and also looking towards uh, using some, some tools that are, are uh, unique and in, in, in emerging um, and not just staying with the status quo. So my, my title today was basically, you know, why, why we can't ignore Phragmites, and so I'm going to hopefully ex um, convince you of, of this fact. Uh, I have a, a Coles Notes version for Phragmites, uh, not much time to explain a lot of things, but so I'm going to go through this information quite quickly, and a lot of it will get flushed out during the Q&A, I'm sure. Basically, uh, we're talking about Phragmites australis. If you look at it in the... In the the uh, plant books, you'll also see it referred to as common reed, giant reed. We have a native plant, Phragmites, on the landscape. You know, we know this from peat cores. Um, and um, that is the, the Latin name for it, Phragmites australis subspecies americanus. And we know this from genetic uh, work from uh, Kristen Sultanstall. And she basically was the one that identified this invasive strain, haplotype M. And initially, it was a subspecies Australis, and she's subsequently gone back and said that's not correct. And so right now, it's just Phragmites Australis, European common reed or invasive Phragmites. So basically, we, we're not quite sure the, the lineage of where it came from in Europe, but it, it's certainly Europe and not Australia. Uh, those of us, yes, I know, <laughs> our one Aussie here says, oh, I don't remember seeing this down there. Um, frag is what we usually refer to it as, a fragging sessions, and uh, anyway, frag for short. And, and, and on... Ontario in Canada it actually was recognized as Canada's worst invasive plant back in 2005, so it's been a long time. Um, and basically, once you recognize it, you see it everywhere. This is the backdrop of Woody Allen movie. So this is native Phragmites. This is basically what it looks like. It behaves itself amongst uh, our native wetland plants. This is invasive Phragmites when it's first getting established, and it's really hard to get people to pay attention to notice it, to do something about it when it's at this stage. It's usually when it's at this stage and say, ah, oh, we have a problem, now what do we do? And it's a lot harder to get rid of. How does it spread? Seeds, rhizomes, stolons, all the viable plant parts, and basically wherever they land in moist sediment. So here's one of billions, trillions of seed heads out there. They're, they're uh, low viability, thank goodness for that, but those that germinate uh, do very well. Uh, another way it can spread is uh, particularly along the Great Lakes, a storm event where you have an established cell, gets broken up during the waves and winds, and anything that's viable uh, will get redeposited somewhere else along shore. A stem will fall in the water, and along those nodes, it'll start to sprout. And this is something that's really disturbing to me, all that standing dead biomass. If it gets broken down from wave or ice in the winter, and then it gets deposited along the shoreline, if it's in moist sediment, those, some of those nodes are viable, and they'll start to sprout too. And I hadn't noticed that until a couple years ago. So once it's established, like once those roots get established in the sediment, it's um, what's happening below ground that we don't see that uh, really makes a remarkable invasive plant and really high densities. Um, and these uh, below ground uh, structures can go really deep to get the nutrients in the water they need. And basically it's an exponential growth. So here's a side profile of all the roots and rhizomes in a really established cell. Um, and this is the example of that exponential growth. So this is coming, normally this is happening below ground, you don't see this, but in, in some wet situations, these stolons are above the, the surface. So this is coming from one parent stock. So all those parents out there are sending these out in different directions during the growing season. And about every 30 centimeters, there's that new shoot coming, and eventually that'll get established, become a parent, and it'll um, start uh, sending out its, its um, shoots. So this is August. It still has about four weeks more of growth. So that's that exponential growth. And as was mentioned earlier, this, this plant has a really wide habitat tolerance. There's, there's not too many habitat um, conditions that it can't survive in. Um, so uh, that makes it a really uh, very aggressive, invasive plant. Here's an example of uh, what happens if you have a high lake water year like we have this year. I was out a few weeks ago. The, the stalk on the left is standing dead from last year. That little fuzzy green thing is out of focus. I had my camera underwater. I was standing in about uh, a waist deep water. But that's how they can grow in deep water because they get the oxygen from that standing straw, that dead stalk that's up above the water. The oxygen goes down and then it, it gets, uh, gets the oxygen to these new shoots. 
or uh, during the growing season, if uh, you have an established a cell, as the water levels rise slowly, they can send out these adventitious roots to get the oxygen, or just uh, scoot them across the stones across the water level. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter how deep it gets. The other extreme, as I mentioned, those roots and rhizomes can go very deep to get the water. So if it's hot and dry, it doesn't matter. Really strong competitor for nutrients. I have yet to see any of our native plants out compete, and that includes cattail, willow, and buttonbush. It's aliopathic as well, so like a walnut tree, it sends out some toxins as its roots to kill the surrounding plant's roots. And basically, there's nothing native uh, on the landscape to keep it in check. Humans have to do this. Uh, there was a map shown earlier. This one is um, compiled. These are actual sightings of phragmites using various um, models uh, or um, reporting methods. And uh, so you can see there's quite a few red dots here. There's actually some missing. I know uh, some areas where there's frag and, and it's not shown here. But basically, it's, it's pretty much widespread. I'm sorry St. Lawrence is missing off of this map, but it's, it's there as well. Why is it spreading around? Well, in the 1990s, when it was realized that there was a problem with Phragmites, but we didn't know we had the, the uh, invasive strain for sure, um, there was a lot of linkages, a lot of research uh, going, uh, going on there to try and figure out what was going on. Really neat study came out of Quebec a couple of years ago, direct link to transportation corridor development and the spread of Phragmites. And uh, Karen Alexander with the Lake Huron Centre for Coastal Conservation mapped Phragmites from Sarnia all the way up to... Um, uh, along the shoreline of, of Lake here in the northern end. And wh what she found was wherever uh, Phragmites was starting along the lake, there was a creek coming in. If she went up in the watershed, Phragmites was in the ditches. And this is how it's spreading around. Heavy equipment will go into an infested site, does its work. They get on flatbed trucks and they go to the next site. They don't get cleaned off. So all that viable plant material is being spread around. And it's being spread around to our northern communities now. If, uh, for those of you in Ontario, if you go up to cottage country, it's all along the highways up there now, and that's how it's getting there from southern Ontario. It's also becoming a real issue in uh, the drainage ditches, um, in particular in areas where it's been there the longest. And it's now starting to cause an issue for farmers where it's plugging the drains and the far farm fields are staying uh, flooded longer and it's impacting the production. So this is a common site along some of the agriculture areas where, where I come from. But this is a massive one down in Sarnia. This goes for several kilometers and Lake Huron is just uh, a little bit to, to the right of this picture. This just drives me nuts. As lake levels drop, people take their recreational vehicles out and roar through our coastal areas and they're spreading fragmites around. So they go through the frag and then they take it to the interior and we're seeing more and more of this activity going on. So what, who cares? Uh, it was mentioned there's a lot of impacts on uh, communities, on, on people, and, and these are real impacts uh, that are occurring now, particularly where Phragmites has gotten a, a foothold. And Nancy's gonna talk a little bit more about this as well, so I won't get into these, but for me as a wetland ecologist, this is my concern. When I go into coastal wetlands and they're infested with Phragmites, the impacts are absolutely uh, astonishing, and uh, that's why I got involved with with trying to deal with Phragmites, we are losing our wetlands. We're losing the habitat of what the remaining wetlands because of Phragmites. And some species are really susceptible. For instance, turtles. We'll find dead turtles in the frag because they, they get into these uh, really dense stands and they have to turn and twist sideways to pull themselves through. There's no food and no water for them. They run out of energy and they can't find their, their ways out. So what are our options for dealing with Phragmites? I'm gonna go through uh, these three. Basically, I don't care what method you choose, uh, there, there are, can be impacts. Uh, when I go into a Phragmites stand, on the edges, the, the wildlife will utilize. So in for about 10 meters, you'll find uh, nests and you'll find the wildlife using them. It's the interior that are basically dead zones. So wildlife are utilizing the edges and, and, that, and people have to be cognizant of that uh, if they go in a certain time period. So this is basically my model, like do the most good with the least harm when you're dealing with frag. So biocontrols, uh, there's been a, work, a lot of work done in the last decade by uh, Bernd Blossie and his colleagues. They went to Europe to see what was feeding on frag that, there, and then uh, they looked in the eastern seaboard in the States, and so they basically have it narrowed down to two moths, their stem borers. Um, they will target native phragmites, uh, but, and, and they also recognize that this isn't going to solve the issue like purple loose strike beetles did, but it will be another tool that we can utilize. There's more information. Burn has a, a webinar on the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative if you're interested. 
And we've been trying everything, covering, tarping, uh, may or may not work uh, for certain areas. Um, drowning, we're using that now, we're using the lake levels where we cut those straws and tried to, to drown out the frag. Here's an example up in Lake Huron. Uh, we use these, uh, these brush cutters and clear out areas and, and uh, we have to keep going back, but at least we're able to do something. Um, or if you're cutting it on dry land, uh, there are issues with that. Uh, there's some areas where they take mechanized equipment in. The native uh, species will come back, frogs and snakes and toads, and then they're chopping those up as well. So there are impacts. There's a lot of work going on, a lot of mo mobilization in communities this is up in Georgian Bay where they're cutting to try and stop the spread and, and the seed head production. There's a lot of work. Or spading. This is actually working along the shoreline here. So also a lot of work for smaller uh, cells, this actually is pretty uh, viable. But what do you do with this stuff, where you've got literally hundreds of hectares, thousands of hectares, really? We have to use a herbicide. And in the States, they have the tools, they have the right herbicides that they can use over water, uh, and they can use it uh, from ground application or from helicopter. And, and they, they've been doing that for a number of years. In Canada, our options are very limited. We have two products. Um, Weathermax, Vision Max, or Arsenal Powerline, they have glyphosate or mazapir, not allowed for over water. They have a surfactant that's very harmful. Um, and so there's a lot of um, restrictions also in place uh, for use of these, these products. So you imagine coastal wetlands, how, how the heck are we dealing with, with uh, FRAG in these, with these uh, limited uh, tools? And, and it's been very difficult. So, you know, it doesn't matter what herbicide you have is water friendly or not, you know, you have to be cognizant of a lot of the different situations. But these are examples of how we're, we're working around water levels and, and dealing with, with Phragmites, and it's, it's a challenge. We've all realized you've got to get rid of that biomass once you've sprayed it and killed it. If you can get, burn it and get it out of there, the system response is remarkable. So here's an example of my buddy Darren up the shoreline of Lake Huron. We do transects to go through before any control is done. It was sprayed. In 2012, lake levels were down, rolled and burned, and there he is. Um, and so a remarkable uh, response from native vegetation coming in, and we see this time and time again. But there's the remnant Phragmites. It is so hard to kill all of it after one shot. You have to keep going back. It's this remnant piece that's so critical that you keep on. And we're frustrated because we don't have the tools to deal with it in water. Uh, what are our challenges? Basically, uh, we're working with our hands tied behind our back right now for dealing with uh, Phragmites and wet sites. Uh, I mentioned the remnant survivors. Those are, that's a critical piece, and that's an ongoing um, several years of, of work. And basically reducing collateral damage. So we're working in areas where there's species at risk plants and animals, where we have native plants we have to work around. Uh, we're at low and high density, so you can't use the same tools in the, in the same area. Water, we have to go work around it or we have to stop spraying. Hard terrain, we can't reach the areas. High windy conditions, so how do you apply herbicides in these sites? How do you get to some of these areas? We can't, and really high density. So these are the challenges that we have. Recreational, of course, uh, dealing with, with folks that want to use the shoreline. So basically, we're using very site-specific approach. Uh, we're using whatever tools we have available as best we can, and in some areas, we, we, we just have to leave, unfortunately. But I think we're at a crossroads. We either just keep bumping along doing what we're doing in isolation, or we get a concerted effort together. And I, I think we don't have an option. We have to do this, because this is what's happening now. Folks are getting upset, and they're taking matters into their own hands, and they're scorcher society, I call it. They're using herbicides inappropriately, or, or doing some things that are very damaging to the, the, the coastal area and the lake um, through their own methods. So this is what we need. For Ontario, we need to have the right herbicides. And we have to be able to use them from the ground in the air. We don't have that capability right now. Um, we have to get it off the roads. This, for me, that's an easy fix. Get out of the ditches, get off the roads. It's much easier to deal with it there than it is in the wetlands. Uh, a better education campaign going. A lot of people don't know that that grass growing along the road is invasive and it's a problem. Um, this is critical, and this was brought up yesterday as well. You have to have local engagement. You have to have the local community involved because there are a lot of hurdles. There takes a lot of effort, and Nancy's going to talk about this more. But this is really important. And you have to have a game plan. You have to know where it is, whose property it's on, what partnerships you have to form. Um, what are your options? What's it going to cost you? Where do you prioritize? 
Um, what's your short-term program? What's your long-term program to keep it going? Because once you start, you can't stop. And then who's going to make sure that, uh, who's going to be managing this? And I think municipalities are in a really good position to be doing this. And this is my message. Uh, don't ignore it because eventually you're going to have to deal with it. Thank you. These are actually these folks I've been working with for a number of years in Fragmites initiatives on the Great Lakes. I just want to put a shout out to them. So thank you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, you'll notice in one of the slides there was a picture of a lady named Lynn Short. Yes. And uh, Lynn was actually part of the uh, public consultation information session that we held in uh, Tay Township just about a month ago. And uh, I'd also like to thank the members of this organization. Uh, we passed a resolution on Wednesday calling on uh, the province of Ontario to make this a noxious weed. Calling on that, uh, we'll see if we get any traction on that. I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Cooper and uh, the town of Collingwood for bringing that resolution forward. And uh, we'll see if that happens. That will enable us to go on to the private property and to start working with uh, our local residents. Once again, thank you, Janice. Our next speaker is Heather Braun. Heather is a senior project manager with the Great Lakes Commission in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She is responsible for the management of the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative and has worked in wetland conservation for over a decade. She holds a Master of Natural Resources Management from the University of Manitoba. Please join me in welcoming Heather, Heather Braun. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak with you about the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. So the purpose of my presentation today is to describe the complexity of managing Phragmites in an interjurisdictional setting and to provide you with an overview of some of the communications and coordination um, opportunities that we have developed through the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative and, and of course, to invite your participation in that organization. As Janice mentioned, um, my map is a lot uh, much coarser scale than what Janice used, but Phragmites, uh, the non-native Phragmites has spread throughout North America. And it is a massive problem across the United States and is a huge problem also um, within the Great Lakes. Because of the way that it spreads, it is a major issue that requires the cooperation of all jurisdictions. Um, working ind individually is, is not a way to address this species. It's something that we've learned over time um, often managers work independently on their own properties, landowners work independently, um, and that is sort of a recipe for disaster that we need to get beyond. Phragmites affects the biodiversity and ecosystem functions of habitats. It impairs uh, the socioeconomic values of shorelines. It increases the financial burdens for land managers and threatens habitat restoration efforts funded by state, uh, local, federal, and um, public, other public programs. Because of its impacts on biodiversity and um, the socioeconomic value of our areas, this is a, a major focus for land managers. There are a lot of Phragmites management efforts taking place across the Great Lakes. Traditionally, these have been really scattered efforts, and we need to be able to pull people together in a more comprehensive approach. Otherwise, we will end up with a lot of funding resources that are essentially getting wasted. Um, back in about 2000, there was research in the state of Michigan conducted in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers that established a protocol for the management of Phragmites. Um, this is a, a combination of an approach that includes the use of herbicides in the fall, followed by flooding, um, removal of the uh, standing dead material by other mechanical means or by fire, and then a retreatment of new growth the following year. Uh, this is a very effective treatment for Phragmites. It is management, it is not control, 
It needs to be done repeatedly in order to be effective. It's also very expensive to do. It is very time consuming. And managers realize that they're not, uh, managers who do ecosystem restoration are not doing ecosystem restoration when they're managing Phragmites. They're managing Phragmites. So um, we're not looking at our ecosystems in a holistic way when we're managing Phragmites. We're essentially um, treating the symptom rather than the cause. And we have the, um, we're potentially impacting a lot of other species when we do Phragmites management as well. Um, what we found was that there was a lack of regional coordination in doing these efforts, um, and it resulted in a lot of redundancy, a lot of inefficiency. A lot of people were managing frag, a lot of people were doing it wrong. Even though there was an established protocol back since 2000, um, I was at a meeting in 2012 and was shocked to find out that um, at one area of Michigan where that research had been done 12 years ago, people were still managing Phragmites incorrectly. They were applying herbicide early in the spring, essentially wasting herbicide, putting unnecessary herbicide on the ground, spending money, spending time. And, and frankly, I was shocked that this was taking place in the area where all of that research had been done, where a, a handbook had been developed to, to describe how to manage FRAG. Um, after attending that meeting, you know, the light bulb went on that said, we need to develop a regional strategy to pull together people across the Great Lakes community to share resources, to share stories, um, and help encourage a dialogue so that we would be more efficient and more effective at, at Phragmites management. So we used a collaborative pr approach, and the approach we're using is called collective impact. And the, the intent of collective impact is pull, to pull together a diverse group of players toward a common agenda. So everyone is working toward a common understanding of the issue and a common agreement on what we want the situation to look like when we're done. This would provide us with greater efficiency in our actions, less redundancy in our efforts, a wider reach, and, and give us an opportunity to be, uh, to be viewed as a region, as a respected and organized. So based on that, in 2012, the uh, USGS Great Lakes Science Center and the Great Lakes Commission came up with the concept of forming the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. The purpose of the collaborative was to form a regional interactive communication strategy dedicated to technology transfer and uh, information sharing and network building. Our goals were to engage stakeholders interested in Phragmites management, to streamline information transfer and reduce redundancy. At that time in 2012, every small township or organization was developing a fact sheet on Phragmites. We don't need a thousand different fact sheets on Phragmites. Um, but without this sort of a communications web, that's, that's where we were. We didn't know what our neighbors were doing. We didn't know what was happening in, in New York, Wisconsin, Ohio, Ontario. Um, we now have an opportunity to bring those people together. We also wanted to get past the action of just managing Phragmites. We wanted to get into adaptive management and look at the ecosystem as a whole um, and encourage a systems-based approach to management and conservation. So through the collaborative, we formed a structure which includes a broad advisory committee. Our advisory committee was developed to represent um, both geographically and by issue areas. So we have uh, federal, state, provincial, academic, local, nonprofit, tribal, and private representation on our advisory committee. We also have a smaller steering committee. And then uh, the Great Lakes Commission um, serves as the backbone organization or staff support to continue um, to work on the Phragmites Collaborative. I just wanted to go through some of the resources that we have available. Um, what I would love, if you haven't looked at the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative website, um, is to go there and look at it. Um, this website is dynamic, it's interactive. We have the ability to update it constantly, and we're doing that. And the website and our communications materials were developed based on the needs of stakeholders. We held a stakeholder survey in 2012, and we asked people what they wanted, what they needed. And that has driven our, our communications products. 
We came back in 2015 and did an update and found that stakeholders are using our materials, but we wanted to test the waters. What's, what's next? What are people interested in now? Um, and we're always open if you have ideas or needs, please contact me to find, uh, and, and we'll work with you to, to help address your situation because every stand of Phragmites is, um, is different. And the management approach that you may need to take will be different, or your capacity will be different, or the regulations that you're working with will be different. So it's hard to recommend, uh, you can't recommend a blanket management strategy without knowing the specifics of your circumstance. So we have a lot of resources on our website. We have a lot of information to help you manage Phragmites. In the US, where we are legally able to apply herbicides more freely than you are in Canada, we saw a lot of herbicides being used. Uh, in many cases, they were being used incorrectly. And they are being used incorrectly by people who should know how to use herbicides. As a result, we developed an herbicide quick guide to help, um, to help ensure that herbicides are being used properly. We don't want to encourage the use of herbicides where they're not necessary. Herbicides cost a lot of money. They have a lot of other impacts that we want to minimize. So we want to ensure that they're used safely and properly. We also have information on recommended management techniques. As Janice mentioned, cleaning of equipment is really important. So we need to get our road commissions involved in this process. We have information on cleaning equipment that will help with that. Most recently, we've developed a suite of best practices case studies. Um, and you'll hear, be hearing from Nancy Villar next, who is one of our focused, our, uh, focused case studies leads. And these case studies are intended to showcase a suite of management efforts across the Great Lakes region in a variety of different scales. And these case studies walk through the entire planning process for Phragmites management from the very beginning when you're working with your local community to develop your plan for frag money's management, to how you actually do the management, your follow-up monitoring, and then your evaluation to determine what your next steps are. So they're very comprehensive, and, um, and I encourage you to look at these to determine if one might uh, look similar to your situation. Um, and then, of course, there are contacts that you can follow up with um, to determine if you want to emulate something like that. We also wanted to provide a source for up-to-date research and, and um, the status of research on Phragmites. So we try to highlight current research. We are trying to work with researchers to ensure that um, research is tied to management. Research can often occur in a vacuum um, and be separate, separated from management by years. So we're trying to streamline and integrate man managers with researchers um, so that we get uh, a much more interactive system and we can get uh, answers to our research questions that affect management um, much more quickly. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing this is a, a new strategy. Um, it, it's an adaptive management framework, and this is a new approach that we're developing. USGS in Ann Arbor has hired um, a postdoc fellow who's actually working on a model with us to help develop an adaptive management framework that will enable land managers from across the Great Lakes region to enter into their, enter their data into a system that will um, help them inform decisions, help them reduce the uncertainty of Phragmites management, and come up with more efficient approaches to Phragmites management. Uh, this is an adaptive management cycle. Um, we think it will really be an excellent way to um, both interweave the community of those engaged in Phragmites management, as well as provide uh, more direct solutions to efficient and effective Phragmites management. We also have a very active webinar series. We've held 20 webinars over the last uh, three years um, on management, mapping, and research. Um, these are all recorded and available on our website, so you may be interested in those. We also have a large social media presence, and our goal is to reach as many people as possible. Um, because of who the Great Lakes Commission is, we're heavily involved in working with the states. 
Um, but obviously, there's a much larger community out there. So um, getting involved in social media, Facebook accounts. <clears throat> we have a listserv with close to 600 people on it. These are just other ways that we can build a community around Fragmites and get people to work together. Um, as I said, we had a stakeholder survey. In 2015, we went back and asked land managers um, whether they were learning from the Fragmites Collaborative. Um, what this pie chart shows is that people have changed their management approach based on the work of the Fragmites Collaborative. Um, the text at the bottom shows that when we took out the people who answered the survey who are not directly involved in on-the-ground management, we had 64% of actual land managers say that they have changed the way they manage Fragmites based on the work of the Collaborative. So that was a really big number for us because it shows that people are modifying their approaches, they're attempting to be more strategic and efficient in their work. Um, so based on that, we want to continue to provide resources that will help align people to work together and more effectively and use our resources most efficiently. We found that um, through the Great Lakes Fragmites Collaborative, um, uh, based on our research, more than $16 million of funds from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has been spent on Fragmites management in just the past five years. $16 million in the last five years on management that will basically last for two to three years. We need to do this management, but we need to find ways to continue to do management that is more long-term than just two to three years. Uh, Janice had some really incredible images, and we saw the materials from NASA that show the predicted spread of Phragmites. So we need, um, we need consistent approaches um, to move from, from this ongoing uh, spraying and, and management uh, to more control, to get control over this issue, really work together on it. So I want to acknowledge my partner at the USGS Great Lakes Science Center, Kurt Kowalski, and also our funding from uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Our next speaker is uh, Nancy Vidler. Nancy joins us from the community of Port Franks, Lambton Shores, Ontario, where she serves as chair of the Lambton Shores Fragmites Community Group. This committee has successfully formed partnerships with the municipality, local conservation authorities, the Lake Huron Centre for Coastal Conservation, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, cottage associations and private landowners. She is also a member of the Ontario Phragmites Working Group and has assisted Dr. Janice Gilbert with the creation of the Invasive Phragmites Management Plan for the municipality of Lambton Shores. If you want to find out about how you can build partnerships and make this work, we're going to hear from the right individual. Please join me in welcoming Nancy. Um, thank you very much, and I too am delighted to be here today to share uh, some of the, the success stories that we have experienced in, in Lambton Shores. I'm going to be um, approaching this from the grassroots perspective. Our committee is, uh, consists of seven volunteers, six are retired people like me. So, um, what I thought I would do to begin with is just give some background information, then uh, talk about some of the projects and the initiatives that we have underway in Lambton Shores, and then end with um, some suggestions as to how municipalities can help. So, um, Lambton Shores is located within Lambton County uh, in the southeast basin of Lake Huron. We have uh, beautiful areas of natural and scientific interest. Some of these areas are, have provincial, are provincially significant and many are globally rare. We have oak savanna, Carolinian core forest, coastal wetlands and beautiful coastal dunes and also many interesting rock formations in Kettle and Stony Point and in, and in Arcona. 
The economic base of our, our municipality is tourism, recreation, and agriculture. And we also have very high shoreline property values, and, the high pro and that equates into uh, high property tax revenue for the municipality. Um, what's even more important is that our residents are very proud of the natural heritage that we have and appreciate all the different species, uh, species that we have and um, the beautiful sunsets. So this is what was happening on our shoreline. And this, uh, this photo um, is, was actually taken from Lambton Centre United Church Camp, just uh, southwest of Kettle and Stony Point, where we have um, many, many acres, well over 300 acres of Phragmites along the shore. And this was the, this was the recreational area for the campers. So needless to say, they had to put in a pool because the uh, property manager was having great difficulty in getting this under control. So we, what happened was in around 2008, we, uh, we started noticing Phragmites on the beach in Port Franks. We have a beautiful, beautiful beach. And it, we owe a huge uh, debt of gratitude to the Coastal Center, the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. If it wasn't for the Coastal Center, we wouldn't have even known what we had growing on our beach. We were, do, we were involved with a dune management project, and uh, we noticed, or Jeff Peach actually noticed that there was Phragmites. So he uh, followed up by inviting uh, a representative from our beach association to um, a workshop that they put on in Southampton. And, um, we were able to get all kinds of very valuable information and then take it back to our cottage association. Uh, our beach associations, be be two came together and we began a control project on the beach. We knew that we needed to have a letter of opinion, which is an exemption from the Pesticide Act. We knew we needed to have a species inventory taken. We knew we had to hire a contractor who was really comfortable working in sensitive environments. And we also knew that we would be paying for this ourselves because it was a private, private considered a private beach. So we just did it. We got on top of it right away and we experienced some success. What I really want to, really want to point out here though is that as Janice mentioned, in 2005, this was, dis this was um, declared Canada's worst invasive by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and yet here we were. By the time we got involved with this project, it was 2011, and there was still no, no public education available. So because of the success on the beach, we, we started looking at the bigger picture, or we took a landscape approach, as the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change refers to it. We looked at the landscape. And we realized that we, we had to deal with the spread vectors, the watershed and the roadside ditches within the village of Port Franks. The, um, the, the, the creek and the river emptied out into Lake Huron on our beach, and unless we got it under control, it would just continue reoccurring. So we, that meant we had to involve other partners, and so we approached and engaged the municipality of Lambton Shores. We went, we went to a council meeting. We had the support of the Coastal Centre and our contractor. We took a delegation. We had 10 minutes to do a presentation. And we uh, talked about the cost, the, co the high cost if it was ignored, and the impact it would have on tourism and recreation in our area. And our goal was mainly to educate because people didn't have a clue what, what this plant was. So we asked for $5,000 and the municipality did give us that so that we could begin working on some of their lands that were within these watersheds. We then approached the Conservation Authority, and initially the Conservation Authority was not, not in, engaged at all. And finally, in frustration, I had never met Jan, but I, I got her contact information and called her, and I asked her if she would come to my home and meet with some people from the Conservation Authority because we, had, uh, we have seven of the eight species of turtles in our area and we have a very successful turtle monitoring program that the Conservation Authority was delivering, but they were not 
seeing the connection between uh, the negative impact that was going to happen to the natural habitat and, and the turtles. So they, Jan agreed, we had a meeting, and the Conservation Authority uh, came on board, and now they work with us. Um, they're a great partner, another great partner. Nature Conservancy found out what we were doing, and they actually approached us because they had land in the area. And with private property owners, we, we um, went to over 125 private property owners and had them sign off on two permission forms, one for the use of herbicide, if appropriate, and the other for a controlled burn, if appropriate. So with all of these organizations, we taught cost, the high cost of doing nothing, whether it was the cost of the environment or financial. So we began working on larger projects with our partners, and our partners supported us by, by being the applicant in the grants. We are not a registered organization, so we relied on them, and we would work with them on our grant application. And then we went back to the municipality and asked the municipality to hire um, Wetland Ecologist Janice uh, to draft an invasive Phragmites management plan for the municipality of Lambton Shores. And that, that plan was adopted by council in uh, March 2014, and we continue to work using that management plan as a guide. So what, are, what we, the strategy that we used was that we, based on the success that we experienced in Port Franks, we started reaching out to the small, the other communities along the lakefront. And uh, we would, our goal was to set up subcommittees we, the Lambton Shores Phragmites Community Group, helped them with educational material, community information sessions, grants, uh, applications, training volunteers, coordinating restoration work and co with the contractors and providing uh, post-treatment monitoring. And this model really seems to be successful. In fact, uh, about three weeks ago, we had our first meeting with Ipperwash. They now have a group called the Ipperwash Frag Fighters. And we ha are arranging a meeting uh, in July with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, um, St. Clair Conservation, oh, the municipality and cottage associations and Nature Conservancy were, in, were coming together in July to start working together in getting it under, under control in Ipperwash. And as a tangent here, I just want to talk about Grand Bend for a moment. I don't know if you're familiar with where Grand Bend is. But because we knew what, for, by this time, we knew what we were looking for, we were able to find 12 small cells of Phragmites in Grand Bend. We got on top of it with Grand Bend Horticulture and the Asable Bayfield Conservation Authority right away. It cost $3,000, $3,000 to get it under control and it took probably five months. Compare that to Port Franks, where we are probably over $200,000, and another coastal meadow marsh that's beside uh, Kettle Point, refer to it as Wood Drive, where the rest of the uh, management program is going to be well over $300,000. Early detection and rapid response, your ability to get on top of this when you first see it is so important. It is so important. So then what we, we did, all of this just seemed to, to flow. We asked our municipality to then begin treating the ditches that were adjacent to the shoreline projects. Um, we organized a meeting with Lambton County Public Works and our community services uh, department. And for the first time, the people that were treating the roadside sat down and started talking. Um, they now work together. They have the same contractor, which is great. Um, we, deliver, we delivered, developed and delivered an education and training program for frontline staff, and that included uh, municipal conservation, hydro, the adjacent municipalities. We pulled in as, and contractors. Our goal was that if, if the municipality was tendering, then the contractors that they work with would have attended that workshop. Um, our, the county and municipality are now committed to um, con keeping the control going on the roadsides. Our municipality has spent probably $10,000 or $10,000 a, $10,000, right? No. Am I saying that correctly? Okay. For the last four years, uh, the, the county has uh, invested, of course, more. 
And what's encouraging is the Ministry of Transport Ontario is now treating the provincial highways in our area. They have a huge project going on this, this um, summer, going right up the Blue Water Highway, and they're also going to be treating the 401, 402, 403. There's a lot of activity that's going to be going on. We also contributed to the smart practices for controlling invasive frag in Ontario's roadsides. We addressed the concerns um, associated with the construction of wind turbines, and now Phragmites is an important addition to all land use, land, future land use agreements, uh, which is something for you to think about if you have wind turbines going up in your area. Um, and we continue to draw attention to the fire, the risk associated with fire hazards. And I have some stats here. This was actually provided by the city of St. Thomas. Between 1996 and 2010, in New York State, they had over 7,000 frag fighter fires. Um, it last 15 years in Staten Island, New York, 103 frag fires with flames shooting more than 70 feet in the air. April 2010, Staten Island, 40-acre wetland frag fire, one house destroyed and two damaged. March 2012, Interstate or Michigan I-75 and Jocelyn Road, uh, frag fire took four hours to control, disrupting traffic flow on a major U.S. freeway. 2013, on Harsons Island in Lake St. Clair, 150-acre frag fire, uh, reaching 2,000 degrees, and heat created its own wind and spread ember embers. In April 2014, in Salem, New Jersey, 20-acre frag wetland fire destroyed two fire vehicles valued at over $200,000. This picture also from David Collins in St. In St. Thomas shows um, hit the concern. In St. Thomas, the city has, uh, actually the FRAG committee is now a committee of council. I think they receive about $20,000 $20, a year, part of the budget, and the police and fire services are very involved. If police see um, uh, that an intersection is, is blocked, and presenting a hazard, the city must go in and remove it. And similarly, if the fire department reports in an area where there is concern, the city has to act. So um, next we, move, we route moved into the agri agricultural community. Um, the municipality was referring calls from farmers to us. We organized a meeting with Don McCabe from the OFA, and the OFA has been very supportive. Um, Jan Janice was invited with our group to present at the executive meeting of the OFA, and we received their endorsement um, shortly after that. We also created a fact sheet for controlling frag, my, frag on agriculture and rural properties, and we delivered two community information sessions. So, we continue to do the work that we're doing. Uh, once you start, it's really, <laughs> it's really challenging to take a step back which I think our municipality recognizes in our committee, but anyway. Um, but how you can help. First of all, as Janice said, recognize it's a problem. You may not have a lot of it right now, but if you've got a little bit, it's gonna become a problem. And take a landscape approach. Look at the big picture. Efforts can't be piecemeal. Uh, you, we need municipalities to take the lead. You're in a great position to take the lead in, in this. Um, and how can you do it? You can hire a staff person or assign an existing staff person to maybe take this on. And whenever I mention this, I was up in Blue Water and I mentioned this to the deputy mayor and he said, oh, we don't have any money. And I, I, challenge, I said, you know, we have to stop thinking that way. We have to start thinking solution and how we can do this. This is an issue. This is really important. And we have to shift, you know, have that paradigm shift and start thinking how can we. And one of the ways we can do this is by taking a watershed approach. Um, getting other agencies and organizations and community groups similar to ours involved and look at the whole watershed form a committee with other stakeholders, create a management plan. It's really important to know where you're going to, and, and the mapping, know what you're dealing with when you, when you begin. Train frontline staff and educate the community. Treat the roadsides, track your control efforts, ensure disposal is managed properly, 
make a long-term commitment. It's not going to go away after the first application of a herbicide or the first spading or wh whatever method you're using. It's going to, you're going to have a long-term commitment. The good thing is that the cost usually goes down. The initial cost may be the, the, the most. Also consider incentives for property owners with large cells. On our shoreline, we have farmers who have about 100 acres along their shore, and they didn't ask for it to be there, and it, that's a huge cost to them. So somehow working with them uh, to, to help them to, to get it under control and take concerns to higher levels of government. Um, in our area, as Janice has said, we, need, we desperately need the tools. We're fighting this with our hands tied behind our back. The ground that we've made is really being jeopardized with high water. So, thank you. I'm ending with this. This is, a, this is really, this is quite cute. This is a little dwarf lake iris. It's a species at risk. And we treated this area two years ago with herbicides. And Jan found this on the shoreline about a month ago, growing in the Wood Drive area. So herbicides do work, and the seed bank is there, and the native vegetation does come back if it's done properly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nancy, and also thank you to uh, Janice and Heather. Uh, once again, uh, the organization that we applied for for funding is the Land Stewardship and Habitat Restoration Program. So if your municipality is looking at doing something, this is for my uh, fellow Ontario municipalities, that's a way uh, that you can uh, get matching dollars to uh, start working on a program uh, of eradicating uh, Phragmites in your community. Uh, we do have time now for some questions and discussion, and I'd like to start off with uh, the first question, and then we'll move to the audience. And the question is, uh, for each one of you, uh, what do you see as the greatest municipal challenge surrounding Phragmites management? And if you can sum it up in 30 seconds, that would be great, but that would be the question I'd like to ask. From my, from my perspective right now, it's actually getting municipalities to be aware that they have Phragmites in their community and, and then how, how to take action. Um, I, I do find that uh, in areas along the shoreline, it's not, it's not so much um, of a, a knowledge a gap because the, the local community is letting their, their council know that they have frag in this problem, but it's the interior communities that have frag muddies in ponds or along creeks or in their natural areas, and no one's aware of it. So for me, it's a, a public education uh, piece that's missing. Okay. Nancy? I, in, in our municipality, I, I, I at times get very frustrated because our municipality has the mindset that they will only um, treat and help on municipal property and the ditches. And I guess that's why I, I, one of the first things I said is there needs to be a staff person who can bring things together and coordinate. So I would say that that's a big challenge for okay. us. Okay, thank you. Heather? Um, I, I would just say my perception is that, um, like all things with natural resources, there is uh, the, the issue of resource allocation and providing the right people, the people who understand the layers of bureaucracy. You heard Nancy talk about all the permits that you mm -hmm. need to get, the clearances that you need to get. Um, this is a, is a sort of a specialized um, suite of services. Um, but you also saw how important it is to get on top of these issues early, how less expensive it is to, to treat satellite populations as they're getting established versus, um, versus once they are established and you've, you've crossed that tipping point and you've got sort of a lifelong management effort in front of you. So um, changing that paradigm to, to look at solutions early is, is my recommendation. Okay. Thank you to all of you for your response. Uh, I actually will have Minister Murray in my municipality tomorrow on, on an event, and I guess I'll have to add that to the ever-growing list of questions that were brought forward uh, at our regional meeting on Wednesday that I should make the minister aware of uh, from, uh, from, from, from the three of us, the, th the panelists, and also from the organization. Uh, we'll now turn things over to the audience for questions. Uh, please identify yourself and who you represent. 
and please state your question briefly so the panel has a chance to respond and others will have a chance to ask their questions. So do we have any questions uh, in the back, first of all? Hi, Carl Gebhardt, Ohio Lake Erie Commission. Uh, Heather, I believe it was you that mentioned there has been $16 million in the last five years that have been spent on uh, control methods, uh, results potentially lasting two to three years. Is there a need to establish more of a priority type of uh, program with the funders through GLRI to say, yeah, it, it's nice to fund these programs, but here's what we're really going to fund where we have longer, uh, longer beneficial results? Thanks, Carl. So yes, the question is, um, do we need to prioritize funding? And um, I think we do need to prioritize funding. And, and currently, states in the US are, are working on prioritizing where they want to do management, because states are strapped for resources, both, both their own state resources as well as those federal Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funds. Um, so the states are actively trying to prioritize where they want to invest their funding. Um, but I think hopefully we'll, we will be moving. As the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative evolves overall, I think there's a, a refining of where funds are spent to ensure that they're spent in the best places in the most efficient manner to make the, the biggest impact. I think we are headed that way with Fragmites. There needs to be a broad communication effort around that issue to ensure that the justification is well understood by stakeholders, but I, I believe we're headed um, slowly but surely in that direction. I believe uh, Peter Ketchum had a question. Uh, David Ulrich's given me the, the high sign that we have to wrap things up very quickly. Have I got time for two questions, David? No. One question. Peter, you get oh. the last question. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, David. Uh, this has been terrific for me. And Nancy, what really I was pleased to see and hear was you can win, okay? Because that, that is something that I have had great difficulty in, in believing. But you have done it. And you're right to say go to the municipalities. That we're doing things in that, on that basis. But really what I also heard is that's not enough, particularly in Ontario, because we have you, you went around the system and you got uh, uh, authority to, to apply various chemicals to, to look after it. We need more than that. We need the province behind us to give us the tools. So, you know, it's up to us in Ontario to do more than, more than just do what you did. We have to do much more. And Scott, I don't know what we are doing in Ontario. You seem to be a a lead guy here, so uh, uh, the question is also to you and Whoa. as well. <laughs> but really, Ontario is in trouble. This is something that we can only look at as, as being a cancer at this point. There is no cure, it's only managing the sickness. Well, okay, we got really quick and then I'll quickly respond and then we have to go. So, so what I didn't have time to explain was uh, there is an emergency use permit application that went in that, that w the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry took the lead with the support of Na Nature Conservancy of Canada, Ducks Unlimited Canada, and uh, a private hunt club in Long Point Bay. Um, that was submitted. It is now, uh, and what that is for is for a, a glyphosate product called Roundup Custom to be used for 500 he hectares of control in Long Point and Rondo this year uh, it, from helicopter and, and uh, ground control if that gets approved. And, and there's going to be uh, quite a bit of monitoring that, that goes around that. Um, so we're just waiting to hear if, if that's going to be approved or not. So uh, we're, we are making some headway, but it's, uh, it's been uh, slow. And, um, uh, but anyway, we, we're, we're, making, we're making some headway, and hopefully this gets approved and, and uh, we, we can uh, um, make some headway this summer in a very small area. Uh, the uh, can other chemical company, BASF, have uh, submitted an application for their product Habitat, which is a Mazapir-based, also used in the States here. And uh, so the timeline for that to go through the Pest Management Regulatory Agency under Health Canada is probably uh, two years. So uh, anyway, they, they've taken action that way as well. 
And just to quickly answer Peter's question about what, and I, I am hardly the lead on this, I think a lot of municipalities are involved in this, is basically you have to have a very frank discussion with your council and a very frank discussion with your staff because your residents are having that discussion with you. So I think that's where you have to get, you have to get council to buy into the fact that yes, indeed, we have a problem. We are the, we are the ones that are gonna be the driver of getting this thing started and bringing individuals like Nancy to the table to be able to do the work on our behalf. But if you do not have that commitment from your council or have that commitment from your staff, what's come out of this discussion is, if you don't get on it quickly, you're playing catch up the entire, the entire you're, if you're not in the, leading the first quarter, it's awful hard to come from behind in the fourth quarter. And with that being said, thank you to our panelists.